Prof. Savikas can be able to respond live to your questions. Welcome, Prof. Savikas. Hello. Thank you for joining me today and for allowing me the privilege of speaking with you. I want to introduce you to an approach to career counseling that was designed to meet the needs of a postmodern society, a society where we find people at risk in an uncertain work world. The approach is called Career Construction Counseling. And one of the international thought leaders in developing this approach is our colleague and friend, Professor Kobus Marie. My goal for this presentation is to differentiate the three dominant career services that practitioners have available to use, to describe the rationale for the third one, Career Construction Counseling, and present a case to illustrate how it can be done. So to begin, the three career services are vocational guidance, and in colleges it's sometimes called career advising. The second is career education with students, and the same approach with adults is called career coaching. And third, career constructing. To begin, all three services are valuable. They are each very effective in accomplishing the goals for which they were designed. The question to practitioners is which client or student gets what intervention and when? Who gets what when? The first service, vocational guidance, was developed in 1908 across the globe to help immigrants to countries, people who've moved from the farm to the city, help them find a job, to match them to a job. In the United States, it was called vocational guidance, and it emerged from social work as a approach to helping lost children, helping child saving. It uses an objective approach in which it views the individual almost as an object, as a social actor, and assesses their interests and abilities and skills object objectively with tests and inventories, and then matches them to existing jobs where they resemble the people that they'll work with. So it's approach for matching to jobs. It doesn't give a different perspective to the person. It helps them solve the problem by adding new information. The second approach emerged after World War II at mid-century as the rise of international corporations became apparent. We didn't have the concept of career until that point, because career is the value of a bureaucratic organization. So this approach helps people understand how they can make decisions and choices and uh, apply their skills to climb the ladder, to move down the path of career satisfaction and success. And its focus is often on career maturity and career stages. The third approach began about the dawn of the 21st century as the work world changed so dramatically. Instead of focusing on jobs and on climbing the institutional ladder, it focuses on the individual as a unique designer of their own life. So instead of focusing on the social actor as an object or the career development of an individual in a corporate or institutional setting, it focuses on the client's unique story in making career decisions and transitions. So the original meaning at mid-century of career was career as path where the individual moved down the path. It responded to corporate society. However, starting in 1978 with the worldwide oil crisis, 
corporations started to downsize and become flattened. And in our current post-corporate society, we've moved from industrialization and machines to digitalization, from urbanization to globalization, and from immigration to world workers. Life and career has become less predictable, less regulated, less stable, less orderly. It has become deinstitutionalized. The institutions use the individual in their career. Today, it's individualized. The German philosopher Beck says that we are in a risk society with a great deal of uncertainty. And in this society, we have to use our own story because that's the only place that we can find certainty in our own story, in our family, in our community. The word career in English came from the French career, and path or journey was the second meaning. The first meaning is cart, chariot, car. And so today we view career as the cart, the chariot of your story. It's your story that is your career. Your career is the story the person tells about themselves and their working life. It leads to the new idea of sustainable careers. doesn't mean careers in sustainable ecological products. It means a career that goes with you for your whole life, a career that has coherence and continuity and meaning and mattering for you. The big difference between guidance and career construction is guidance focuses on who you resemble. The test scores say who you look like. In career construction, we focus on your uniqueness, your unique story. Instead of just matching you to jobs, we focus on the meaning that work can have in your life, how you can fit work and choices into your ongoing life. And the difference in the practitioner's behavior is as a guide and coach, we lead from ahead. We are experts in the uh, occupational information and the world of work, and we know how to use tests and inventory scores to identify resemblance, and we can suggest and tell and be helpful. Career construction, we lead from behind. We are not experts in content. The client is the expert in their own life story. We are expert in the process and in listening stories and helping people understand more deeply what they already know. The difference to me pragmatically is a guide and a coach can begin the first session by saying, how can I help you? A session for career construction is the counselor is not the expert, the client is. So it begins not how can I help you, but how can I be useful to you? How can we use this conversation to help you identify the choices that must be made, what's at stake, and how you can move forward in your life? Leading the process encourages autobiographical reasoning. And we want the client to engage in reflection. So we have an agenda, a process agenda. And the agenda helps us listen for the career story. The literary critic Eudora Welty distinguished between listening to a story from listening for a story. And counselors listen for a story in doing career construction, systematic and practical way. It's called the Career Construction Interview, and these materials are available to you freely. On the left, you see the Client and Counselor Workbook. On the right is the 90-page How to Do It Manual. What I would like to now do is go through a case with you to illustrate how to apply this common sense yet 
truly effective method of helping individuals know themselves and design their lives. I'm going to discuss the case of Michael. Michael, at the time, was a college senior majoring in information technology and minoring in biology, and he was trying to decide what he should do, what occupation he should pursue after he graduates from college. I chose Michael as an illustrative case because he just as easily could have been a high school senior as a college senior. Career Construction Counseling with Michael followed the typical three-part format. In the first part, in this case the first session, I conducted a career construction interview. In the second session, a week later, we reconstructed the stories that he offered into a life portrait and then applied the life to autobiographical reasoning about the decisions he had to t make and the actions he must take. And in the third session, a week later, we did a follow-up to see how things were going. With Michael, it was three one-hour sessions a week apart. However, I've done the same thing, and you can do the same thing in a one session, just dividing it into three 20-minute parts. The idea is to follow the format given the time requirement that you have. Let's begin by looking at the first session career construction interview questions. The format, the agenda, appears on this slide. It has the opening question and then the five questions to elicit the autobiographical narrative. The first question is the opening. How can I be useful to you as you construct your career? and you can get as much backstory as you wish. I get very little because I believe that which is important will emerge during the course of the dialogue. The idea in listening to the client's answer is to see them as foreshadowing the development of a theme and beginning to establish a mood and a plot. In the case of Michael, when I asked, how can I be useful, he said, in brief, help me find what I really want to do. I cannot decide. Kind of terrifying to leave school after 20 years. Michael was a graduating college senior who said he was undecided about what career he should pursue. So the first small story that we're trying to understand is how did Michael construct himself? How did he compose and arrange elements from role models into a unique character as a social act? So the question is, who did you admire when you were growing up? And we're looking for descriptions of models because they reveal the self-concept. If we ask him what his self-concept is, it just go blank. But we ask who he actually modeled himself after. Michael's answers were Emmett Smith, an American football player, and you can see how he described this person. Tremendous athlete, team player, good guy, funny, intelligent. I always ask for three. His second role model was astronauts because they have the courage and bravery to do extraordinarily things and they're smart, they don't panic, and they fix things. And his third role model was Arnold Schwarzenegger because he viewed him as brave, daring, charismatic, entertaining, and fun to watch. What we listen for in the description of the role models is the first words because they're most salient and the repeated words. And as we distill through the words that Michael used, we group them into calm, does not panic, brave, courageous, daring, intelligent, smart, resourceful, funny, entertaining, charismatic. This is his self-concept. This would be, this would, these would be the results of a personality test should we have given one. The second question goes beyond who 
the person is as a social actor. It tries to find their manifest interest. What stage, what context of life, who do they want to be around? Who do they resemble? This is our interest question. So we asked, do you have any magazines that you watch regularly? And uh, many young people don't. So we then ask about TV programs and then maybe websites. But we find what vicarious environments manifest the client's interests. Manifest interests are more predicted than our inventoried interests. After they tell us their say, favorite television show, we say, what do you find interesting? What do you like? What attracts you? What do you prefer? Because we're looking for their motivations and their interest path. Michael said he liked Game Informer because it reviews and forecasts new systems, new ideas, profiles of developers. And he's read it, and he's just recently took gaming as a possible career. What attracts you to the Newsweek? I like the science, anthropology, a pressing issue, really current and important. Innovations in technology. I've always loved technology. And television shows, because so few young people read magazines, asked for television shows, and he liked House because he was brilliant and he saw beyond facades and was still successful despite having deficits. Then our third question, uh, favorite websites. If we already have an answer about television shows or magazines, we might not ask this one. But he liked gaming blogs. He liked the news and the reviews. So we use these magazines, television shows, websites to assess clients' preferred interest environments, hell and cold, reassect environments. You are probably familiar with the reassect types. But if not, you can just listen for what is interesting to Michael. The idea is that the magazines manifest interest in particular environments, as you can see from looking at this portrait of magazines. The same for television shows. These are vicarious environments that the person prefers. They manifest their interest. When we listen to Michael's, he seems to prefer investigative and artistic environments. He likes the technology, innovation. He likes the gaming, the creating, and the uh, innovation. Now we have social actor. We have interest pattern as a motivated person. And we want to know what script, what script does he want to play out? What is he anticipating as his next career move? The question that brings us forward is current, always current favorite story from a book or a movie. It reveals how Michael is scripting his next move. It, it tells us what he is anticipating doing. His was, what's your current favorite story from a book or movie, was Dune. And of course, you don't have to know what the story is about. So you ask him, tell me the story. Tell me what the story is about. And you're listening to this being not the fictional story, but the anticipated script that Michael is considering. So it's, this is about Michael. So the script that he's plotting intuitively, one kid is born a prophet, he's brilliant. He's supposed to become the person that society wants. He defies a monarchy that oppresses people who live in the desert. He lives and joins the oppressed and helps them to raise their standard of living. He helps them to rise up against the monarchy. He's going to lead his life the way he wants to lead it. So that's the script. Now our fourth question is, what is his advice to himself? Clients want advice. We don't know what to say. We don't have the right to really say what one should consider doing. So we ask the person, what is their inner authority? What does their inner therapist suggest that they do? How is he to enter, enact this script? And his answer to what's your favorite saying is, better to be a smart ass than it said it used to be. The careful, thoughtful approach is the way to go about things. But today, it's the other one. And then we ask him 
to tell us an early recollection because the early recollection gives us the perspective that the person is taking on the problem. This isn't the Adlerian psychotherapy question. This is just a question that elicits from the person what kind of schema or uh, idea from the past is he using to consider the problem. For each early recollection that you get, we do not interpret it. It's not our job. We don't have the authority to tell a person what their life means. So the way we have the person make meaning of it is have them make a headline to the story, a headline like it might be used in a newspaper. So Michael's early recollection, I was living in Korea, we lived in a condo, there were Korean neighbors, I would put on this mask and I would go for Halloween and I'd run around and chase the little girls and we'd do that for 10 minutes and then they would to their parents and they'd feed me this amazing food. I would scare them, I was little and did not have any friends and they were my energy outlets. I would take off the mask and then we would be friends. I would take off the mask. I would take off the mask. And then when asked for a headline, he composed, boy takes off mask, gets rewarded. So his perspective is to get his reward and transition from college to work, he has to take off his mask. He has to actively master what he's passively suffering by taking off the mask and defying the monarchy to bravely and daringly jumpstart his career. Let's listen to a transformative moment in the interview with Michael so that you can see and hear how he used the session. Where I want to start tonight as I read back the story and, and we relate it to career decisions. The, the first story, that was a charming uh, story, and there was a moral to the story that I thought was very intriguing. And it was after you had the mask on and chased them around and scared them, it's when you took the mask off that you got rewarded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, so one of the... One of the things um, that you're telling yourself with that story is that you sometimes hide behind masks. And the mask Absolutely. is the computer screen. You, you told me you always have the computer in front of you. And, mm -hmm. and the point of that story is uh, now it's time to take the mask off to get the reward. And, and what are you thinking as I say that? What I've been told by my parents, friends, is my parents, break out of your shell, like, don't be afraid to be who you are. So you... Don't uh, use technology as a crutch. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... That's not a crutch. It's a it is, safe it's haven. Yeah. yeah. It's a mask. It's comfortable. Yeah, yeah it's a mask. And, and, but this is more important wisdom, Michael. This is coming from you. Mm -hmm. This story was you, and you said, I would take off the mask, and then we would be friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh -huh. it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful summary of exactly what you're doing right now. You, you can't hide in college. You can't have the mask of the computers, and you're working on your courage to take off the mask and sometimes it scares yeah sometimes it scares you because it's comfortable and I also heard you say sometimes you're not sure what's behind the mask pretty interesting what you're telling yourself <laughs> yeah um, it's just that, that's, the, that's the part that's hard yeah the jumping mm -hmm. didn't used to be hard when mm -hmm. you were a little kid somewhere it got somewhere it got hard high school and I spoke yeah. out. In the handout that you could download is the summary page, and you can see that the counselor fills this in with the client, or the client fills in alone. So from the preoccupation you fill in, from the role models you fill in, from the setting, from the script, and so on. And now you have, from the five sets of small stories, the big story, the story.
It starts with the idea of being needing to take off the mask. And then we would say, you are, Michael, calm, daring, intelligent, resourceful. You want to entertain, you want to work as part of a team. And you want to work to create computer games, have some humor, use technology in innovative ways. And you are a brilliant boy who's supposed to become what your parents want, but you have to defy the monarchy and leave home to lead life the way you want. You'll be happy when you're able to be successful as a creative and brilliant problem solver in play innovative technology to create entertaining computer games. And you will then become independent and have a successful career. To do it, you have to be a smart ass and defy the monarchy rather than be a dumb ass and hide behind the mask. The first session we collected the five stories and the second session we read back this script and we have a dialogue about how, how to use it and what it means. And of course Michael clearly knew he wanted to pursue a career in King use of technology to create games and gaming, but he was afraid to defy his parents, to defy the monarchy, and take off his mask. But in hearing his own stories and listening to himself talk about his life and his career, he came to the courage to act on it. So he, after the second session, he applied for jobs in the gaming industry. And in the third session, a week after the second, he was on his way to actively pursuing what he dreamed of. A month after the third and final session, he had moved to a large city in another state and began a job as a game designer working with an in innovative team. Now, of course, not every client experiences this quick and fitting a resolution, yet Michael was ready to take off his mask and jump into his career. This is the way that we do it. We use the My Career Story interview workbook to help the person narrate the story of their self, the stage they want to act on, the script they want to portray, their advice to themselves, and their perspective on making the decision. This is explained in detail in the Life Design Counseling Manual, which, as I mentioned earlier, is free to you. If you want to download them, you can go to this website and download them. If you want to purchase materials, these are not free, but they are available. Now I'd like to respond to questions, concerns, issues, hear some of your insights, and who would like to begin? Welcome back to our live Q&A session. Thank you, Professor Mark Savickas, for joining us and availing yourself. I think after that incredible presentation, it's gained quite a bit of interest, and we do have a couple of questions coming in. Our first question that we've received, um, question to Prof. Savickas. Because my role model question specifies that you should think back to when you were very young, Clients often report that they can't remember. Same with early recollection. How do you handle if after a long time and after much prompting, there is nothing forthcoming? Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the excellent question and thank you for allowing me to join you this morning. It, it, it's a question of having the person engage in reflection. Uh, for example, when I teach a class and I ask the class who to think of their role models, sometimes up to half the class has a hard time thinking of it because they're not in that frame of mind. And so we have to somehow activate reflection and that schema. And occasionally when, when I have that uh, difficulty, the first thing I try is reduce the jargon. I, I try not to ask a uh, role model. I try to, I start by saying, who did you admire? Who did you uh, look up to? And maybe even more common language, like who was cool or who was really neat in your life? You know, maybe the, the role model term is um, intimidating. Also, 
I move up in age, you know, maybe in middle school, maybe in high school. And if they still are having a difficulty coming up with it, then I drop it because the whole is in every piece. As you ask the five questions, you start to see you get a similar answer from the coherent identity of the person. The same with early recollections. I, I just, you know, I ask, you know, what do you remember from high school or what do you remember from uh, your work years or what do you remember from yesterday? Any story that they tell will give us the schema. So uh, as long as it's a safe space and we have them talking, that's the, that's the idea. The purpose of the prompts is to get them to speak. So as long as we are engaging them and they're speaking, they will reveal their story. Uh, so that, that's my first thought. Thank you, Prof. So we have one more question for you. How can career construction be used with persons with disabilities? Yes, persons with disability are persons. Every person has a story, has an identity, and it's very, uh, very meaningful to hear each person's story. So to me, I do it exactly the same, the same way, to hear what is the central theme of their life and to try and help them find ways to actively master what they are engaged in, what they're maybe suffering or what might be a problem. The same approach, the same approach works in uh, hospice care in hospitals. It's called, we call it then life review process. We help people say and narrate their story and look back on their life and see the things that they leave behind as a legacy. And it leads to a more graceful, a more graceful death. So every human being has a story and the uh, more, the better they understand their story, the better they can narrate it, the better they can tell it to others, the more fully they can live their story. And if they're out of story, if the disability is has just happened and it has de-storied them, has thrown them out of their normal story, it's time to re-story, to recover a story. Everybody needs a story. Everybody needs a plot, a purpose, a calling, a way forward, a, a personal meaning, and a way of mattering to the community. It's more than just meaning to self, it's also mattering to community. So, uh, I, I, person is person is person. I hope, I, I you, hope that's a useful answer. <laughs> so, we have quite a few questions. However, for those that haven't been answered, we will have them posted on the website for you. I would like to now introduce to you Professor Maximus Sifoto, board member of SACTA, who will be doing a vote of thanks. Thank you, Paya. Professor Yes. Mark Savikas. Yes, sir. Dade. On behalf okay. of the South African Career Development Association, the delegates, and the South African Career Development Community, we would like to extend an Ubuntu thank you to you for the kernels of wisdom you have shared with us. From us in Africa, Rialeboha, Siabonga, thank you. Thank you thank so you much so for much. that, Prof.